can we, uh, can we bring up the QR code for the session? Or is that something we have to do next, after the talk? Uh, we'll have to the talk. So then I will save my little talk with it later then. Um, uh, we have a very, very good panel here of people who are extremely experienced in uh, basically real-time data. I strongly recommend that you just read the, the panel introduction from all of them. So we've got Henrik Jorteg right here, John Fallos, Wesley, uh, who actually did this lovely on-slide demonstration as well, which, by the way, is right there. Um, and then to my left, we have, is it Martin? Martin and Rob. Sorry, welcome. Um, I do recommend, now that we have the on-slide up, I really strongly recommend that you guys take a look at that and get it started. Um, as a perfect introduction to this talk, if you are on an iPhone and you bring up that web page and it goes to sleep, you must refresh the page because the web socket gets closed down automatically. <laughs> perfect introduction as to why we're here. Um, I also would like to try using it during this talk so as many of you as possible can bring it up. We'll ask like some questions along the way. We'll see how it goes. But I think right now we need a general introduction. That's what uh, Heinrich's here for, so please. All right, let's see if I can get my slides back on this screen here, maybe. Here we go. OK, uh, hi, guys. Uh, my name is Henrik Jorteg. I work at a company called uh, And Yet. And I've been building uh, real-time web apps now for about four years. Uh, we started out using XMPP and uh, Strophy.js and Bosch and XMPP and uh, all that stuff back in the day, long polling. Um, then uh, WebSockets came out. Uh, we started messing with that. Socket.io and the like. Um, recently, I've gotten really into WebRTC. Um, I think it's useful before we get too into the technical stuff to kind of step back a minute and kind of realize uh, what what this really does in terms of the web. The web is really about human communication. And so uh, these are my kids. Aww. Aww. <laughs> um, and they love their grandparents. Uh, problem is their grandparents live in Sweden. Uh, for those of you who with uh, uh, Typical American geographic understanding. It's far away. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, that's low. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. This is not this crowd. I, I know. Yeah. Um, so uh, we built an app called. So every every Sunday, um, my kids get to talk to my parents over an app we built called Talkie.io that uses WebRTC. Uh, Talkie.io is the first app I've ever built that actually passed the mom test, meaning my parents can use it. Uh, the, what it is is like uh, anytime you're on the same URL, you're in the same conversation. That's all there is to it. So no login, no auth, uh, no friending, nothing. And it's using WebRTC. There's nothing to install. It just works. Um, so to me, I mean, it, it just serves as a very kind of practical example for how how ultimately like these real-time technologies are actually bringing people together and helping make the web better. Um, so let's talk a little bit about WebRTC. We're going to cover other stuff too, but. I want to focus on this a bit because it's been kind of a recent focus of mine. Um, <laughs> WebRTC really is a lot more than video in a browser. Um, it's, it's actually a low latency, peer-to-peer -peer networking. Um, and that's, that's really exciting. So one of the other cool examples of what you can do with this technology is, a, is a, called PeerCDN. Uh, PeerCDN was actually built by the same guy who did Google Instant. But um, anyway, it's, it's this really cool concept of where, um, say, it actually uses data channels to send files uh, to other current visitors. So say, for instance, I'm, hoping, I'm hosting like a simple little video site, right? I'm actually hosting my own videos. All of a sudden, I'm on Reddit, and I'm getting slammed. So normally, that would be expensive for bandwidth. Uh, but in this case, the, the kind of swarm of people that are gathering on your site to watch this footage uh, can actually download it from each other. So instead of um, so you kind of create this, this almost ad hoc um, like BitTorrent type network, which is really fascinating. It's just kind of an example of what you can do with this stuff. Um, also, given kind of recent uh, stuff with the NSA and with uh, encryption, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, um, I actually think uh, WebRTC is really important for the web. Uh, it's decentralized. It's encrypted. And yes, maybe there's backdoors. Who knows? But ultimately, like this is stuff that we should be doing. Uh, and it's a big win for the web. Um, so how are we doing so far? Uh, well, let's start with the story. Um, a year ago, we built, uh, and yet we built ATTJS. ATTJS was um, kind of a demonstration used at CES by AT&T to uh, demonstrate making and receiving actual phone calls in a browser using WebRTC, um, which is cool. We got it to work, uh, but with way too many caveats. It actually required running a certain modified version of Chromium that the Ericsson team was maintaining. Not ideal. Um, it's gotten better. So if you look at this, so here what we actually have is a 
a Nexus 4 uh, running Firefox Nightly. We've got a Nexus 7 running Chrome uh, for Android. And then a desktop running Firefox Stable and Chrome Stable, all in the same conversation at the same time. So we have, it's gotten better. It's available now on some mobile devices. Um, and interoperability is improving for voice and video. Sweet, so we're good. We can all go home. We should just use this, right? Nope. Um, WebRTC is still quite finicky. Um, and if you've tried to do anything with it, um, you've probably discovered this. So just to kind of give an example, here's what you have to do to set up a video call right now between two users. So first of all, getting user media. It sounds really simple. You request access to their camera and their microphone, right? You'd think. Uh, the, the methods are still prefixed, which is fine. I mean, that's to be expected. Um, they throw very different error types. So in Firefox, the error handler that you give it will give you a string back. In Chrome, it will give you an error object as it's supposed to, but neither quite follows the spec as far as telling you what went wrong. So um, in addition, uh, specifying constraints for like, hey, I want a smaller video um, is available kind of with limited support um, in Chrome and not at all in Firefox at the moment. Um, screen sharing, which is actually really important for replacing something like Skype or Google Hangouts, uh, is uh, available in Chrome, but it's kind of flag. Very hard to detect error types. Um, requires HTTPS. So even if you're running localhost, and if you don't have your own uh, self-signed cert or something, it will just fail silently, and you won't know why. Um, so as a result, we what do we do? We create abstractions. So we wrote a uh, get user media module to handle that part. Um, attaching media stream, also something. So once you once you request media, you have the stream object, and it's your job to then attach that to, say, a video element or an audio element. Um, this has gotten better. They're, they're, the APIs are more similar now, but um, you have to convert it to a blob URL, attach it as a source. Um, in Chrome, you set auto play to true. In Firefox, you attach it and call play. Point is, there's differences. Um, and often, you you want to mute the user's own video so they don't want to echo back to themselves, etc. Um, so again, now that's another thing that should be simple, now has become another module that we were maintaining. Uh, so uh, beyond that, uh, the thing that a lot of people don't understand about peer-to-peer -peer is ultimately you have to have some mechanism for the two peers to discover each other. Um, it's not like we just magically know each other's external IPs and we can just send stuff directly. So. Um, and this, this is not in the spec uh, at all. It's purposely left out, um, so it's totally greenfield. And I actually think that's good. Um, but that means, as a developer, you have to do a lot more work. You have to help uh, the users discover each other. You have to help them uh, figure out how to pass data messages directly to another user, which is not something that's necessarily in the tool belt of the average JavaScript developer. Um, so because now you need some kind of server, server technology as well to be able to handle this. Uh, with Socket.io, it's not hard, but it's uh, it's still something that's new for a lot of people. Um, in addition, uh, you have to do some level of capabilities detection for certain things. So uh, for example, if you do screen sharing from Chrome, uh, it won't appear for a Firefox user. But there's no way that you would know that programmatically without specifying through the signaling channel that, hey, you got users in this chat who are actually in Firefox. Um, so there's just a few, few oddities like that. So then we write a signaling server. Um, so peer connection. So this is kind of the mother. This is like the, the thing that does it all, right? Um, this has some quirks as well. So uh, first of all, the prefix, which is, again, to be expected. I don't think that's a bad thing. Um, create data channel. So this is the data stuff that we're going to talk about. This is extremely finicky at the moment. Um, so you have to pass a very specific set of options to create a reliable channel versus a unreliable channel. It's supposed to be reliable, true, or false, but that doesn't actually work in either browser. Um, as I was just talking to Kyle about, uh, there is a upload limitation in the default settings for Chrome. So in order to actually um, do, get this to work, you have to, if you want to like pass a file around, you have to actually modify the FTP that you send. Tricky stuff. Um, so anyway, we write a wrapper for that. Other challenges, uh, data channels that are currently not at all interoperable between, between Chrome and Firefox. Uh, you can only do one video stream per connection. Um, and all of this is to just, there are other browsers that will do this. So it's not going to get any better. Uh, WebRTC is also unique in that uh, this is actually the first time I know of where browsers have to speak directly to each other. There's no intermediary. So once you set up a signaling channel, like they better be interoperable. And that's a whole new level of spec compliance that's required uh, in order to make that work. Um, and I can only imagine how interesting it will be if uh, Microsoft and Internet Explorer uh, decide to do this as well. Um, 
So uh, I've heard of a library called Simple RT. Uh, just basically, you provide a container for local, you provide a container for remote videos, and when it's ready, you join the room and it works. Um, makes a bunch of assumptions, but this is the kind of stuff you need in order to actually make this approachable. Um, there's alternatives, obviously. Uh, there's PeerJS focused on on data channels, OpenTOK, uh, and there's another guy who's done a bunch of interesting experiments. Uh, I'm kind of running out of time here. So, um, anyway. So the, the big thing I think that's really important is uh, tinkerability is actually what drives adoption of new technologies. So we like to play with new stuff, but not everybody does. Um, so in the same way that jQuery made the DOM accessible to lots of people, uh, Socket.io made WebSockets accessible to a lot of people. I, abstraction libraries such as SimbleWebRC, I don't care if it's that or something else, but hopefully makes it accessible to uh, more people as well. And uh, we really just need more open web hackers to really get into this stuff and build things with it. If not, it's going to be relegated into one of these like, hey, this would have been nice and it never actually works. Um, I really think that you know, if you haven't been playing with WebRTC, like, get in there, build stuff with it, make it happen. It's phenomenal technology. It just needs people to, to make it work. Um, so file bugs, feedback, improve APIs, push for interoperability. Um, we made a little site with a compatibility chart. Um, we're also piping. Uh, kind of feedback data from actual humans about the quality of, of the connections. Um, but encourage you to get involved. Uh, let's make the open web even more awesome with WebRTC. Thanks, guys. Excellent. <laughs> OK, first is a test. Can we bring up the uh, moderator screen again? OK. Uh, I want to see we have 45 people connected right now. Just to, Let's just do a quick test. How many of you would be lying if you said you liked the talk. This is a test. I just want, I just want to, it was just a logic question, guys. Work with me here. <laughs> Excellent. Good. I just want to make, I wanted to see that we got lots of numbers. That's all I wanted to say. So, OK, now that that's working, um, I would like to do follow what Steve said, which is to have each person take about 60 seconds to say any comments, things you'd like to add on to Henrik's introductory talk. So if we could start with Martin. Is this working? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I mean, Heinrich's done, done some great work on WebRTC, and it's, a, it's very interesting, especially the data channel stuff, in my opinion. Um, but um, I think we shouldn't forget about other, other technologies. Uh, WebSockets, it's only, what, two years old. Uh, it's only just now becoming really available in a lot of browsers. And uh, there's a huge amount of stuff we can do with the TCP connection um, to the browser. OK. Rob? Um, yeah, I mean, there's not a huge amount to add to that, but uh, from my point of view, I think what's most interesting, um, particularly with WebRTC, is is the use beyond audio and video. Um, so I'm keen to uh, discuss a little bit more into those kind of use cases, perhaps games, the CDN stuff, um, and just hearing a little bit more about um, what's next. I mean, we have the implementation today, and there's, there's issues with that, but what, what could we do next to make things better? Excellent. Uh, John? Yeah, so uh, I agree with... Uh, point made earlier about uh, other technologies being highly relevant here, I think um, they're each set out to solve different problems. And uh, you know, the talk about the point about uh, signaling channels, I think uh, going through a server intermediary, but technologies like WebSocket are ideally suited to that. And WebRTC, of course, is ideally targeted at the peer-to-peer -peer direct connectivity. So uh, I see it as a very powerful blend of technologies as the web evolves going forward. And Wesley? Uh, yes. I uh, see it. Uh, the centralized part is a little, you know, we got to get past that. But um, for instance, for this tool, all the remotes you're, ha you're holding in your hand, it would be cool if we could pull up WebRTC to uh, use the mic. And that, that way you wouldn't have people running around handing mics out. So, I mean, there's so many use cases, so many possibilities. I think it's Excellent. OK, I think we'd like to move to our first question. Um, I think that's Andrew Betts, if you'd like to. Uh Do we have a microphone for Andrew? I've actually got the uh, Pearl mic, so I should be fine. Just, uh, I've got 100 notes here, so just uh, bear with me a second. Right. Um, so WebSockets and other real-time protocols are commonly blocked by corporate proxies and content inspection firewalls. And that's a particular problem for um, uh, the sort of customers we have at the FT. How much is this stifling adoption, and what can we do about it? Would anyone like to take that? Sure. OK, John. So uh, I think um, just taking a little step back into history, uh, when uh, WebSocket was first added to the HTML5 specification, it wasn't even called WebSocket. It was called TCP Connection. And uh, when we saw that show up, we uh, decided to 
hop on that and try to improve the protocol to make it uh, web-centric and bring HTTP to, to bear so it's actually a web-compatible handshake. And the reason that we did that was to uh, avoid tripping over some of the problems we've seen before on plug-in technologies getting defeated by corporate firewalls. So we felt that was a huge step in the right direction. Now, even given that, we still find situations where uh, even though all the traffic might be over port 80 and 443, uh, even with recrypting firewalls and things like that, that they can still intercept. Um, but it's definitely a much better situation than it used to be. And in our particular case at Kazing, uh, we've uh, implemented some uh, heavy lifting on the emulation side to uh, even be resilient in, in those situations. Uh, initially, we wrote the emulation stuff to kind of precede the adoption of the standard. So we get started with WebSocket uh, architectures uh, uh, over five years ago. But, um, but moving forward, it tends to become uh, something that's still there to support older clients, but also to address uh, any intermediaries that might be getting in the so way. Are you saying it's not a problem or it's easy to work around? On the, uh, on the vanilla RFC support for the protocol, uh, encryption is a big help. Uh, but even in those situations, there can be intermediaries that will decrypt and recrypt on the critical path and can still intercept. Uh, and then there's also many WebSockets that don't want to be encrypted for other reasons in terms of performance mm -hmm. and things like that. Uh, from our perspective, we've seen it be an issue uh, in the wild uh, for uh, non uh, uh, non-compliant browsers uh, trying to do emulation. We found ways in our emulation technique to address those shortcomings. Any other comments? Um, I'll just make one little comment. Um, I would say for, for you know for this kind of audience, um, there's very little barrier. You should you know you can jump on with WebSockets. Um, but if you really want to address all use cases, uh, as John says, you know SSL does help, but um, you need to think about other fallback strategies. Um, one of the things that would would really help, and we, sh we maybe could think about, is um, we we do at Pusher a lot of work to try and uh, to use to reuse successful transports um, again. Uh, but we don't really have enough information about the the browser's network connection to make always able to make good connections. Uh, so maybe that's a, a something that we can talk about later. How we can discover, um, you know, like in the responsive images uh, discussion this morning, um, we were saying, you know, the browser has more information than the web application. This is a case where the web application could do with some more information, really. And the audience clearly likes that comment, by the way. <laughs> um, w one of the. Uh, <laughs> that was awesome. Oh, okay. That was keep that up. That was awesome. Um, one of the comments on the, uh, the Google Monitor said that TLS actually is an effective way around this. Um, just any, any comments on TLS being a useful thing? Yeah, John just said that. I mean, yeah, yeah I'm sorry, we, we, we find that. But unfortunately, there are examples. I mean, for us, you know, we've had uh, schools, for example, and they often block SSL. Um, and they have got a kind of a pretty bad situation. Got it. Any other comments? We move on to the next question. Well, th this problem is very relevant to WebRTC as well. I mean, it's the, the whole concept of punching through a firewall to get a something that you can push directly to an end user is actually really difficult. And this is something that uh, the likes of Apple and Skype have spent lots and lots of money trying to solve. And uh, I would really love to see some of these technologies be more broadly available. Um, <laughs> there's a few open source projects. There's, there's a server called StunD. Um, but like a lot of these are, are really difficult problems, uh, and I wish that uh, there were more openly well-documented solutions to dealing with this, rather than having to, as a blog post that came out yesterday did, uh, actually try to decrypt what's going on with FaceTime and what they're doing to multiplex ports and all kinds of stuff. I'm, this is not my area of expertise, but I know there are people here who are really good at this stuff, and please, please share your work. Uh, this stuff is needed in order to make WebRTC good. Okay. Uh, the next question is up by someone. Uh, is it Gus uh, Gusens? If we can get him a uh, mic, please. Hi. Um, there seems to be some functional overlap between WebSockets and uh, web, uh, WebRTC. Uh, when should you use one or the other? Um, I can take that. Um, sure. So the, the fundamental difference is that WebRTC is, is designed to be peer-to-peer. -peer. Um, so uh, WebSockets, if you're going server to peer or server to client, that's a better use um, for that. Uh, the, uh, the, the I think really where the, the comparison comes from is the fact that once you've established a data channel, it's largely the same API. Uh, beyond that, there are different technologies. So 
if you're going peer to peer WebRTC, if you're going you know through a server, then uh, WebSockets. So yeah, yeah, go ahead, please. As you can say, one of the uh, the other main major differences as well is again looking at um, beyond just video and audio. So for example, multiplayer games, um, WebSockets and, and WebRTC are incredibly different because one's UDP and one's TCP. So you have unreliable data connections and reliable data connections, which just allow for a very different way of doing multiplayer communication. Um, you just cannot do a Twitch-based multiplayer game using WebSockets but because you have to wait for things to come through. Um, but Web WebRTC is allowing us to to use technologies that we've been using in native environments. You want to jump in on that? I was just going to say the support is a little flaky for, for reliable and unreliable data channels. Uh, but it, it's part of the spec to include both. So um, hopefully that becomes easier to use soon. And one of the things I would think that we're likely to see as the unreliable data channels become um, become reliable is, uh, <laughs> is is that actually people will want to implement this on the server side, and so you know to be able to communicate with a game server um, via UDP from a browser is a pretty big thing. Yeah, I think that's a great point, and also um, I think we touched on it earlier as well about uh, using uh, WebSocket server-centric uh, strategies for signaling and setup around WebRTC is another. Another inst interesting variant. Uh, one other thing I would I would mention as well in um, in deployments in certain uh, industries, obviously the security boundaries of these things often uh, crop up. So uh, it's it's very interesting challenge to address some of those uh, boundaries of where the trust boundaries reside amongst the users and amongst the server in a in a consistent manner uh, across both technologies. Isn't there a perception that? that this is like a classic web thing where we've got one standard that doesn't quite work, switching so with another standard that overlaps a bit. And it's just kind of confusing because they kind of are somewhat related. Or can we really say that there's a pure vision of each one of these things and they both exist, they can both be parallel and it's OK? Well, as I said earlier, I think these are complementary technologies uh, that uh, create a powerful combination as we move forward. And I think they have um, well-suited purposes in each, in each way. I also think that uh, there's there's certain uh, issues like uh, the ability to successfully navigate through these firewalls and proxies on the WebRTC side that, um, you know, in, in certain, some of the fallback cases for WebRTC for reachability, WebSocket can potentially lend a hand there too. Cool. Excellent. Um, we have another question then from Matthias is it Kautzman. Oh, my question is... Uh, Will WebSockets protocol replace server sent events in the future? Why must we have both specs if WebSockets can accomplish the same tasks that SSE does and more? I think there's another example of possible overlap. I can take this if you like. Please. Um, I would say you know the server sent events is a very simple protocol. And so I think that drives a lot, a lot of adoption early on. Um, but I think what we'll see, especially as the WebSocket spec um, and get, gets more widely adopted, um, and a lot of some of the missing features become available. For example, encryption um, is currently possible with server send events, but not web sockets. That's bi directional. Yeah. Bi -directional. Well, bi yes, of course, there are extra functionality. But I think the question is um, for just the use cases that one would currently use server send events, are uh, you know what, what's likely to happen? Um, for example, mul multiplexing is another thing that might allow people to use a single a single connection to address to address you know, many use cases on the page. Um, just to add to that, uh, thinking back to um, when we were working on the spec on this stuff, uh, you know, Comet was the uh, flavor of the day when it was uh, server sent events was being standardized as a way to effectively standardize Comet behavior um, several years ago. And at around that time, WebSocket was starting up too. So this exact question came up uh, during standardization process. And apart from the, the points that we made already, uh, one of the uh, overarching uh, arguments that, that was left was that by having a simplified interaction with uh, server sent events, it created a surface area where the browser had more control over the actual behavior. And the idea was that on mobile platforms, this might actually allow the same abstraction to be retargeted at mobile specific solutions that didn't necessarily involve making a traditional HTTP request over a traditional TCP connection and getting a stream of information coming back down it. Uh, you know, so so there are different different implementation strategies for the abstraction. If the abstraction is left high, the the versatility of WebSocket obviously means that you can cover that use case and many more. And uh, Wesley, you actually had a comment earlier on. We were talking about possibly speedy push. 
This just adds to this layering. Of yeah, so, I mean, the way we send data to the client, there's bidirectional, there's, uh, with WebSockets, there's SSE, there's, um, and now we've got HTTP 2.0 coming out, and we've got, right now, what we can implement is Speedy, and uh, that's available in, uh, I know, Node and Jetty and other servers. So, like, it, we've got these three options to, to choose how to push data to the to the client, and and so that's, with HTTP 2.0, is there going to be, I mean, is it going to be WebSockets layered over Speedy? Is that going to be the approach, or is it going to be uh, pure WebSockets, or is Speedy going to have a mechanism to do bidirectional, like push and then also receive messages on one channel? That was mm -hmm. that was kind of my uh, question, which I don't know the answer to. Are there any HTTP 2 experts in the crowd? Yeah. That would be really interesting. Don't be shy. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Based, based on what I've seen so far of Speedy, um, I'd expect it to play out where HTTP and WebSocket go in parallel over the same enveloped uh, uh, Speedy connection is a, at least an option because uh, to keep WebSockets uh, out of that would be to create additional resource hog on the, on the client and server connection for the yeah. TCP endpoint. So it seems like a very natural uh, consequence of having selected an HTTP handshake to get started in WebSocket to let them all play nicely together. Any other comments people want to make about this? Okay. Um, Christopher um, Froelich, you've got a question number four coming up. Um, Christopher? So the WebRCT, WebRTC spec has driven centralized solutions, PubNub, et cetera, to a decentralized problem. What can we do to bring a secure, fully decentralized solution to bear? Uh, that's tricky. I mean, because uh, ultimately you have to have some discovery mechanism, right? Um, there are some attempts. Uh, I forget the name of the developer now. Uh, there's a project where uh, basically you end up copying and pasting SDP blobs back and forth over whatever mechanism you choose. It could be email. It could be whatever. And it still uses stun uh, ice in turn to actually connect. Uh, and I, with firewalls, I don't see that going away. I mean, I, I don't know how to solve that problem. I would love to see a solution. Okay, I want to make sure we also encourage people to ask questions. We've been going, we're, we're running through our questions just fine, but feel free to just jump in and get on the, uh, the delegate list if you'd like. Um, does anybody want to add anything to uh, that question about centralized servers? Or we're thinking about here? Well, I suppose one of the questions is whether we actually, in, when do you need a decent, decentralized solution and when you do not need a de decentralized solution? Um, I mean, I, I was not quite clear on what exactly you mean. What what are the benefits that you'd want to see from a deep from a decentralized solution? Uh, so the first example that comes to mind is um, video collaboration. So uh, my family and I, we've we all got smartphones, uh, you know, high resolution cameras in our pockets, and we'd like to be able to shoot and collaborate on uh, video together in real time. And the overhead in trying to figure out um, where we are out and back down to each other uh, seems like a lot when um, uh, you just want a simple way to connect um, people that want to. Okay, well that makes, I mean that's a perfect example for web for WebRTC. I mean that, that when you need that l super low latency and the UDP kind of style communication, it makes perfect sense. Well in, in theory, Stun and I should help you uh, locate and figure out that those, that they are in fact on the same network and then be able to connect the two. Um, it's not the complete solution, but it's something. What? <laughs> um, sure. So, uh, just to antagonize that point a bit, um, if we're all independently connected, say um, via uh, mobile data, uh, so we're not on the same network, um, and we're using uh, just a plain vanilla web app, um, uh, there's th there there's no clear path. Uh, to a central server necessarily um, in, in a quick and easy to use way. Right. Now you're talking about connecting devices that really are not on the same network at all, and that's a, that's a whole different type of problem, I think. Uh, I mean, I, I think that would be awesome, but I, I don't know quite how that, I don't know how to fix that one. <laughs> okay. Uh, Kyle, actually, I believe, has got a question. Um, let's make sure that he gets something. Is he sitting over there? 
This is a delegate, so we can make sure we get him. Hi. Up there. <clears throat> so it seems like there's two major reasons why centralization still happens. The first one's discoverability, obviously. If we don't have uh, any way for two different people to get hooked up on a blind date, then they don't know where to, you know, what restaurant to show up at. <laughs> so somebody has to introduce the two. But that seems like that should be solvable through other bands. Like, uh, you know, there's been other peer-to-peer -peer networks, music sharing, and you know, BitTorrent and other things like that. It seems like there should be ways to sort of solve that problem. But there's a, another problem that one of the reasons why people centralize stuff is because they want to bill for it. So when companies are creating products around this stuff, if we truly completely decentralized and everything was peer to peer, nobody would know that that was happening and nobody could make a buck off of that. So how do you see that sort of uh, tension happening where we do want to get rid of centralization, but we don't want to not be able to charge for it, for instance? I can comment on that. Uh, so in my opinion, uh, the telecoms of the future are Google, Facebook, and uh, the like. Uh, the old traditional telecom system is likely not to stick around. Um, somebody didn't like that. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, uh, I, but really, I mean, it, it, if you think about it, the reason phones are so successful and they're so prevalent is because I can call anybody. I have an AT&T phone. I can call somebody on Verizon. Uh, why can't I call somebody from Google Plus on, from my Facebook account? The whole, the whole concept of federation does not currently really exist uh, in a broadly accepted way in, in the web. And I think the reason is no one's pissed. Uh, I think uh, if, if, if that, I mean, that's something that if it was retroactively imposed on. No, no, someone, yeah, someone now people are pissed. No, yeah. Yeah, 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 there we go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that's why which stages is, is a bunch of really angry people getting together. <laughs> I guess. I don't know. Uh, so I don't know. I mean, that's 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 the bit of. I mean, that's, I, I think that's why there's kind of this whole silo effect going on. Um, but is WebRTC architected to solve that problem? Is that yes. part of the issue? It is solved. Well, I, I, yeah. I mean, I certainly it it, it it providing just a very base level of technology as far as the communication piece. But um, in order to do, uh, in order to actually you know connect the two, you, that you need other technologies on top. You need the discoverability piece. You need the addressability. You need. Uh, a strong identity, so you can say, "I am a Google user." You can reach me at my Google account, um, that sort of thing. Uh, and, and that's so. WebRTC is one of the pieces. It's not. It's not all of it. And the great thing about WebRTC web, web is that it's enabling, uh, uh, you know, all the web developers in the world. Uh, it's removing a huge number of barriers from being able to actually innovate in that space. We've for too long we've had, you know, desktop applications that have, you know, mm. not been able to. I think the, um, the discoverability side of things as well is a big problem because right now it's just sort of, up, like you said, up to the developers and stuff like that. And there's, there's so many ways to do it. I mean, you could manually paste these blobs and stuff, which is stupid, but you can do it. Um, but I mean, there are ways that we need to, we need to look at how to better solve those kinds of problems as well. Like, I mean, pairing devices or things like that. So it's not always two people that are trying to connect. It might be one person trying to connect two devices. Um, so, for example, I might be want, trying to connect a mobile device to a TV to remote control it. The discovery mechanisms for that are going to be incredibly different than connecting two people who have full control uh, over process and can just join a chat room or something. Yeah. Um, so those are the kind of problems I want to see uh, solved a lot more. And, and people are kind of approaching that. And there's a few solutions with trying to replicate things like Apple Bonjour and stuff in, in the browser and requesting that from the browser vendors, but there's not been significant traction on that yet. Well, it sounds to me like there's going to be a whole topology of applications. Like an awful lot of websites could just put in video chat to our tech support line. Right. That'll be a trivial thing for them to do because it's entirely through in their own stack. Mm -hmm. Then it's about getting bigger. And is that and the issue that we need? Are you trying to say that we need more standards for the bigger to happen? Well, I mean, these these things uh, have existed for quite some time. XMPP is extremely stable and extremely well used, and it's not something that web developers like. But it, they've they've gotten really good at solving these problems, uh, and there's some efforts in underway. Um, two specifically, one is Stands IIO, which is basically the attempt to make to give a clean JavaScript API to XMPP, um, and another one is um, XMPP FTW for the web. Um, and um, you know, in, in thinking of things like browser ID as a potential uh, alternative to identify, you know, to be able to provide that strong identity piece, because once you have that, addressability actually becomes fairly simple in terms of, uh, yeah, once you know how to reach you. <laughs> but but these these solutions are all very he heavyweight solutions, right? All the XMPP, you know, even if it has a nice JavaScript API one day. Um, I think what Rob's talking about is just saying, well, you know, you've got two devices next to each other. Yeah. You know, can they just make a little kind of chirp or a little some video communication or something like that to, to discover each other? I think we're kind of seeing people approach those.
problems um, very, very slightly at the moment, like the whole idea of using audio to connect two devices. Oh, the, um, Boris must do that uh, ultrasonic demo. Right. right, 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 exactly. Yeah, so there's there's people already exploring and potentially not exactly in this area, but mm -hmm. there are solutions around right now. Um, yeah. We've got solutions for pairing Bluetooth devices and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Like there's, there's methods and means. I think we just, we've not seen people use them just yet. And we will, as people start using WebRTC beyond audio and video, and that will just come in time. Excellent. Uh, we got a question waiting from uh, David, actually, uh, from the audience. Uh, David uh, Stickler. And then we'll, then we'll go to Natasha's question. Um, we see a rise of security issue where people are actually trying to open too many TCP connections to a web server and are actually killing the web server by opening too many TCP connections. So people tend to actually remove Keep Alive. Um, to avoid this kind of issue. What do you think about WebSocket and security for this kind of problem? And how can we solve this? Well, I, one of the things that uh, was put into the spec uh, towards the end of its uh, finalization of the standard was a clarification on what's the maximum upper bound on the number of WebSockets that can hit a server at a time. and. Uh, it was unspecified, so we wanted to get that cleared. And at the time, a uh, decision was made to not limit it, but also to add a, a caveat to that, that only one handshake could be outstanding to the same target server at the same time. So uh, from a browser uh, invocation standpoint, you know, spinning up lots and lots of WebSockets in, in uh, rapid succession uh, would uh, give the server an opportunity to uh, intercept and uh, potentially detect uh, repeated attempts and uh, therefore mitigate that. Uh, in general, I think that things like speedy as an envelope, as we touched on earlier, underneath these things, t tends to mitigate some of that at the at the physical TCP layer. Uh, and also uh, having higher level uh, abstractions on top of the web socket going forward that's more of a, um, you know, like a, a publish and subscriber, an event-driven, more architectural approach to things, uh, allows you to partition up the universe of uh, addressability so you don't just think of it as connecting directly to the thing you want to speak to just because that's the end of the web socket. Once you're attached to the architecture, then you can reach a whole myriad of services through that same channel. Cool. Um, I think we're having, the next question is actually quite high level about WebRTC in particular. Natasha, if we can give you that one. Thanks. So this question is from an anonymous sender. Uh, bandwidth throttling, especially for multiple HD video streams, is extremely hard to do properly. Is there any risk that WebRTC will vary greatly by implementation? I think uh, most likely, I'm assuming that this is about one to one is one thing. If you're doing one to four, one to five, I think it gets to be much harder. And are we going to see possibly it just fall over because Firefox doesn't do it as well as, say, Chrome? This this is actually, in my opinion, it's two, two problems. Uh, one, one is, uh, so for example, Skype, what they will do, from what I understand, is they will elect the kind of strongest connection. Uh, it's not just connection, it's about the ability to encode and decode video really quickly. So you need you need a you know, strong device and strong connection to kind of be able to serve as a uh, rebroadcaster. And currently, that's kind of part of the spec, but it's not really there yet. Like if you take a, a media stream from one user and attach it to another, it just doesn't work. Uh, and that's absolutely crucial for this stuff to be able to be usable for um, handling kind of these other interesting network topologies. Mesh is only good for for so many because you're uploading your video to each each person that you're connected to, and so is everybody else. So your upload bandwidth becomes a, a huge bottleneck. Um, well, didn't you say that WebRTC doesn't throttle down? Uh, so down? yeah, that, that, that there needs to be control mechanisms for adjusting bandwidth, and they, they just are not in place, as far as I can tell. Nothing I've tried has worked. Well, well that's actually maybe. I actually, oops, I actually was working at a video conferencing company, and that was probably the biggest aspect of our secret sauce, was to throttle bandwidth properly. So if, if WebRTC isn't thinking about it, it seems like it's kind of heading for a bit of a train wreck. I don't. I don't think it's not thinking about it. I think it's just the implementations aren't quite there yet. Um, that's my impression. There's, there's, I, I've kind of raised it to some of the Google folks who are working on this stuff, uh, and that, that's kind of the answer I get back. It's like, yeah, we, we know this is a thing we got to deal with. And I mean, Google Hangouts, they're, they're well aware. They're, there's a low bandwidth mode for that, and we need to be able to do the same kinds of things without re-requesting a lower, a smaller video size. We need to be able to just kind of adjust them based on quality and lost packets. Yeah, over here. Uh, it's this kind of problem as well, it's um, particularly the, the one-to-many kind of the bandwidth problem is applicable in games as well. So that's where the background is from my point of view. But um, like if you're building multiplayer games, you're quickly going to uh, come over that problem. And 
it's not something you can necessarily avoid in that circumstance because you, you have to be communicating out to these multiple players in a game. But there are ways, and like people have solved these problems before, and there are ways to sort of uh, reduce the amount of information you're sending. So, for example, in a game, you don't send updates for people that aren't necessarily in your vicinity or something like that. So, it's not always a technology problem. It's just a, a creative way of thinking about how the data is being sent to all the different people and are you sending it to the right people there may be a hundred people in the game but there might only be two that are actually applicable um, and need the updates that you're sending another se sort of separate point to that is I think we might need to you know it's only the very early days in terms of peer-to-peer um, -peer connections on the web so if you look at um, you know historically you'd have clients like Skype that are open for many hours uh, on stable you know internet you know uh, broadband connections what happens uh, for example on battery life on a mobile device when you have suddenly you've got four different uh, connections and it's sending the data four times sending the video to four different clients um, and you said earlier about strong peers is that actually realistic on the web I mean our web browser uh, you know our tabs open long enough for that to be realistic I don't know the answer to these questions, but yeah, it's a it's a big push too. I mean, you you have around 50 people connected uh, here all day long using using a WebSocket connection, and I mean, let's see my battery life. I've got about 25% left. So I mean, it's uh, it, this is the same thing. I mean, people are connected. They're using this protocol all day long at this conference, and you know, it's draining the battery. So, and that's one to one to a server, right? What happens if it's one to many with a WebRTC um, right. data connection. Right. Well, it also takes a lot of power to encode and decode video of that task, and uh, and to do it with multiple people at the same time. So that's a, that's a huge uh, drain on power right there. I, I know my laptop fans start going crazy when I'm testing with like five people. So <laughs> it's a big problem. Yeah. I mean, this seems to be back to the kind of discussion this morning about images. I mean, for real time data, do we need to change the way d d data is delivered for someone who's battery con constrained versus you know, a PC. Yeah, I, I see the same thing. I mean, for responsive video, essentially. And again, this comes back to games. Like these kind of problems are being solved in games in in the way you sort of throttle the communication depending on the the bandwidth capabilities of each person and stuff like that. So um, there's a lot of lessons we can we can take from things like games. And and this is why I'm so adamant on I'm not focusing so much on audio and video. Although yes, that is the use case right now. Yeah. Some of the problems that we're approaching are are being solved or being looked at in other areas. And I think it's just interlinking the two and trying to yeah. sort of combine them and, and come up with a solution. Well, I, I am surprised that maybe as a web community, we always kind of wring our hands a little bit about saying everybody and inclusiveness and, and so forth. And Sugar Crush doesn't give a damn about battery life. Right? They're just like, you want to play it? Then just plug the damn thing in, right? And now, I'm not saying that's correct, but to a certain extent, the native community kind of washes their hands of this a little bit. Are we trying too hard? Just saying. <laughs> I, I think enabling mobile is really, really, really important uh, because I, I think, uh, yeah, certain things are, don't matter, obviously. Uh, like, if you're playing some hardcore game, you're not going to be sitting there forever, maybe. But it, to, to not take it into consideration when these are the actual physical hardware limitations that we're dealing with, I think, is, is selling ourselves short. Yeah, and I also, also think it's important that, um, you know, you've you got things in, in place to avoid accidentally doing it. Right, so we want to make sure right. that developers aren't accidentally draining their battery. I mean, if it's a if it's a deliberate decision, that's one thing. But uh, if they just happen to be on the end of a <laughs> bandwidth connection that's a little little less uh, capable, we want to be able to react to that. I think no. we have we we're getting the APIs to play with this kind of stuff as well now. And, and actually, I'm not seeing people implementing this yet. But for example, using the battery API and actually, if the battery level is at a certain point, changing the way you're you're communicating Excellent and stuff point. like that. Yeah. Yeah. I, my point, by the way, wasn't to seriously say we don't care, but to say it is interesting that some apps don't care. And we just do seem to be a little holier than thou sometimes, which is actually good to have that aspiration. That's all. I, I think that may very well just be the difference between thinking of it in a platform perspective versus yeah. thinking of it as an application perspective. Yeah. OK. Um, OK. Um, actually, question number six, I think we've already answered. Um, uh, I believe Steve Thayer has a question. Right here, he needs a microphone. <laughs> um, actually, I think it was Rob who's actually just touched on this. Um, WebRTC seems to have focused more on the audio and video streams, and data channels are a special case. Shouldn't all peer to peer communication just be data streams where the different data types can be interpreted as appropriate? 
I mean, not all peer to peer is. Uh, how, how, do, how do you mean? Like, should they all be the same? Like, ju they're just data channels, or? Yeah, I mean, so I think the, the question was, yeah, the question was sort of saying, I'm just trying to we'll, we'll find a way to rephrase it. Um, why, why are we focusing? Yeah. Most of the panel has just been purely been talking about audio and video, but right. audio and video are just a type of data. Right. Okay, it has specific characteristics. Um, you know, why is the focus purely focusing on those rather than just coming up with a more generic data channel? Um, you can I was just going to quick long one liner. I think it makes a better demo, <laughs> which is why it's <laughs> which is why it, why it landed first. That's my opinion. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's also kind of special case in some in certain ways that you have to you know you're, you're trying to negotiate in, in encoding types, etc. Uh, but yeah, I mean, fundamentally, I agree with you. I, th I think uh, peer connections. You're still doing the same thing. You establish a single peer connection. You add and remove data channels. You add and remove uh, video and audio channels. It's still one peer connection. At least that's the way it's written in the spec. So uh, hopefully, it's actually. Yeah, I don't know. Go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, I think I, I mean generally yes, they are they are types of data, but the the media streaming is incredibly different and much more complicated than just sending sort of basic data across. So there is a reason why they are separated, but I, I truly do think that the the data channel side of thing, like sending generic non audio non video kind of data, is where WebRTC has an incredible amount of strength and where we're not really focusing on yet. So. Right now, we're not exploring that too much, but I'm in very interested to see how that is explored um, because audio and video, yeah, is the interesting thing, and that's kind of why WebRTC was created, and yeah. that's the exciting thing. Like, imagine being able to call Skype from a browser. That's an incredible use case, um, but it's now, where do we take that technology? Um, what's next? And I think the data channels is, is where that's sort of hiding. And, of course, the I, th I mean, as, as far as I understand, there's some, there's some thought of... Um, Bringing in other kind of media streams, not just audio and video. You know, what about you know temperature information or sensor information? I think I don't know if anything's happening there. I don't really know, but I, I've heard it mooted as a possibility. Yeah. Well, actually, there's one comment I wanted to make, which is that so often we expect these specs to be perfect, and if they're not perfect, we get really upset at them and look how bad the web is and so forth. But shouldn't we just maybe say, get, cut WebRTC and maybe others a little bit of a slack and say maybe to your point, what can we do as a community to kind of exercise things and then give some feedback? What can we do just to do that? Yeah, I mean, definitely, I would suggest everybody in here, if you haven't, start playing with this stuff. It's it's phenomenally uh, just, it's very, very, I mean, I hate the word disruptive, but it's a ridiculously disruptive technology. Like, uh, I, I mean, I, I seriously built my own telecom to call my mom with in Sweden. I mean, come on, like, <laughs> how, how, I'm not supposed to be able to do that. And so this is the kind <laughs> of power that it provides you. And I, I, I would love to see everybody here really get in on hacking on this stuff. Uh, Stephen? <laughs> well, I guess, I guess just on that on that, that last point, just what you said there, if we could quickly poll the, the panel, you say this is awesome, like what other use cases would the panel would the panel have? If you could each nominate a use case for WebRTC of something cool that you'd like to see that you think that this technology enables. Excellent question. Can we just go through? <sighs> Video conference. No. Um, <laughs> 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 I... Yeah, I mean, so like it would be cool if if the remotes that you guys are using, like I said earlier, you could just pull up, get user media, and you wouldn't have to hand you a mic. You know, you could just speak to your phone microphone and be broadcast. So that would require like hooking up to the AV here. It would require you know writing the code to handle the binary um, data. But um, yeah, and, and then there's like a lot of geolocation, like in room. Uh, Geolocation, like there's been a lot of investments made in companies doing this lately, to where you actually can find devices in the room with uh, much greater granularity um, uh, using, like, uh, you know, a geolocation uh, API. So with WebRTC, you could say, okay, um, I know this. I guess you would have to have some centralized mechanism, but you could find out all the people who like the color blue, and then you would be able to pull up a video chat with them in this room you know, using that newer technology. So there's complementary technologies, I guess, that would be required for that use case. But that's yeah. an idea. OK. Yeah, I think um, just enabling the, the Internet of Things, uh, machine of things kind of stuff. Uh, you know, Because a lot of times with a centralized model, uh, we assume that even though these devices may be talking to one another, that they are actually um, able to potentially uh, mediate or coordinate against some uh, connected server system. 
Uh, so, you know, just not having to rely on that always being around, but still uh, blending these two worlds together seamlessly. I think that's a tough challenge uh, to do well, but just raising the abstraction a little bit so it makes these things easy and uh, get it out of the developer's hands for trying to solve all these complex problems. Uh, at Kazing, we call these things, uh, call it the web of things, the state of the internet of things, because we think that a lot of the challenges that we see in trying to connect together those uh, IP or lower level protocols with WebRTC that we um, don't actually see so much in the web socket because it's web centric uh, is achieved by raising the bar a little bit and connecting everything together at the web level instead of thinking at the internet level. So we say web of things. Cool. I would love to see uh, peer distributed rebroadcasting. Uh, why couldn't I pull up my uh, my phone and, and be able to just stream something just off my phone to the entire internet? Uh, if you have a proper uh, rebroadcasting ability uh, where a peer could relay uh, that feed, you could basically create, uh, you could turn every person on the planet uh, with a smartphone into a news reporter capable of live broadcast, uh, which is phenomenal. Uh, and that's again, that's video and audio, but uh, I think that particular one's really interesting. Um, of course, you can do the exact same thing with any other type of data. Uh, Examples, sheesh. Can't think of anything off the top of my head. I've been too focused on the video stuff. <laughs> cool. Uh, I've got to say, I mean, the, the simplest one is, is games and how that's going to completely change now. We've got UDP and unreliable data, but the second one is is the web of things, like uh, these interconnected devices and actually having the the non-human interaction and, and devices talking to each other. Like, that's where it gets really interesting. We have phones powered by JavaScript. The entire operating system is written in JavaScript. That's incredible. Um, we now have like uh, Arduino-like devices powered by JavaScript and stuff like that. And how how are things going to change? And how could we use WebRTC to interlink those devices? And what does that now allow us to do that we couldn't do before? Um, using web technologies that already are interoperable with all of the other things that we have available to us, like the hardware APIs and just all of the other web APIs. That's where things get very very interesting. Yeah, I think I would just reiterate that point. I mean, it's it's enabling, it's disrupting the the control. Any any when when you need a, a very ultra low latency connection um, between two objects, it's now possible for web developers to build those things. So you know you have a control surface for a quadrocopter or something. You can now build that in the, in a web browser. It's amazing. But isn't it going to be an issue that not too many Arduinos will be running Chrome right now? Right. So how do we get WebRTC into these lower level devices? Someone needs to build it. Okay. I mean, I just want to make sure I was following up what you said, because what you said is great, but I, there's no immediate way for us to do that, correct? This right. is it's a room of future. developers, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody can do it. I mean, this is partly why we're waiting for or we're asking about WebRTC on, on the server and things like that. Like, once you can get it into things like Node.js, then, then there's a, yeah, a lot. Yeah, that'd be huge. I think we have a few minutes left, and Christopher has been patient. Um, we'll do him and then, I think, you, okay? <laughs> Christopher? No, that, that Christopher. Sorry, I apologize if I sound like a broken record, but um, uh, as soon as you said enabling technology, um, uh, I'm brought back again to the idea of decentralizing the solutions. Um, I mean, you think of uh, dissidents, uh, dissident suppression, um, say in Arab Spring, um, and the uh, raw potential that exists in the phone to directly connect people um, without a central network connection that isn't possible, or emergency response as uh, earthquakes, hurricanes uh, take out centralized communications, um, it seems like the technology exists to, solve, to help solve these communication problems. Yeah. Um, so that, yeah, go ahead. Really just a comment. No. I mean, that's a really interesting problem. And uh, that's something uh, I mean, I've not developed for, but I've been thinking about a little bit. And the whole idea of mesh, creating sort of uh, mesh networks out of nowhere using these technologies is incredibly powerful, like the ability to uh, then spread communication amongst a, an ad hoc local network is is crazy. You have to get over the the actual connecting the two devices together problem. But if we can solve that, then what you can actually do with that is incredibly powerful. It's kind of like the only way you can do that now is to carry around some extra little antenna with you with an extra power supply and create your own network. I mean, that would have to be like standard issue <laughs> for emer emergencies. Yeah, I mean that's today. Yeah. But your your phone cannot power that kind of transmission and that. Kind of bindability. So. Right, and then you've been patient. One more question. Um, yeah. I'll just say it doesn't seem um, like it, it doesn't seem like you need a web browser in order to um, um, in order to have WebRTC. You could always do it through Node or through an, a JavaScript on chip device. Right. It's, it's a simple matter of programming. Yeah. 
just doesn't exist at the moment. <laughs> there, there have been some efforts. There's actually a Node RT library they attempted to bind uh, to libjingle, uh, and I don't quite know the status of that. It hasn't had much activity. but. I think we've got the uh, wrap up. So thank you very much. If you like the session, please give us a vote. And, uh, and if you don't, then give us a vote. And, um, and thanks Wh whoever's for writing the script to do like 50 votes, go ahead and up that to 100. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Thanks very much.